my great pleasure to welcome to you Time Space Visualizer, Hayley Nabauer, costume designer for series 10 of Doctor Who. Hello, Hayley. Hi, how are you doing, Helen? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Yeah, great, thanks. Thanks for having me on here. That's all right. Um, I want to start, um, costume designer is possibly something that people are aware of, but can you explain more about what the job involves? Um, lots of conversations with people. You spend a lot of time trying to to get information out of and, and into people and get them thinking about things and then their thoughts back. So, um, you know, the starting point is, is usually always the script. You read that, you try and get the base idea of what it's about and then, uh, and then lots of conversations between everyone because everything, particularly with a sci-fi, is, is so open to interpretation when you talk about something that doesn't exist in the real world or on the real timeline or it's from history. You want to find out how did the person who wrote it imagine it? How did the other people who are working on the episode imagine it? What do they see? How do they think that's going to look to make sure we're all getting on the same page uh, so that what we create um, meets the expectations of, of the others we're working with as well so it, it makes a cohesive look. So I think as costume designer, a big part of what I do is, is communication, trying to ask questions, give information and make sure that exchange is working for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, once we've got the information, um, my process, I, I tend to hand draw um, and design everything from scratch. Uh, and I like to make as many costumes as possible from scratch. So for something like Doctor Who, I mean, that was a dream job because you get to do everything from the past, present, future, all over the place. And you never know where the next episode is going to, to take the, the story and the costumes. Um, so I like to do my research, have my conversations, draw designs often there'll be several different versions that change as I get feedback and then I'll redraw mm -hmm. it uh, sometimes I do a finished illustration sometimes it's just a quick sketch or we work to uh, images I found online because um, or from other research because sometimes you don't have time to draw everything um, and we just keep going back and forth until I've got that final design that's been signed off and then we get to the process of making it um, on series 10 of Doctor Who, I set up a, a workroom on site, which we had through the series, and we, we made quite a high percentage of the costumes ourselves. Um, so, and then some other stuff we did outsource to a, another workroom and a couple of other makers in, in other places locally when we had a lot to do. Um, so fabric sourcing is probably my favourite part of the job. Um, <laughs> going and, and digging through and finding interesting fabrics and uh, you know exciting colors and buttons and trims and and all of that I love that part um, finding the things that will make the design in, from an idea into a real finished uh, costume uh, and then further communication is is working with costume cutters and makers who actually help to um, make the costumes real to bring them to life to make them from a 2d mm -hmm. concept to a 3d finished garment and make them so that real people can wear them and move in them and do, do all the, the things that they need to do in that script um, to bring the story to life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's that's a lot, a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. It, it's, you know, it's all fun and it's fast yeah. paced and it's busy. Yeah. So you've spoken there about fabric choices. Mm -hmm. um, so it, does that depend on whether it's like a historically set episode or a futuristic episode? Will that kind of determine your fabric choices or you kind of fairly free anyway um it depends hugely what the episode is of course um i suppose uh thin ice which was episode three of series 10 that was mm -hmm. the one which was had the closest based in base in history um i suppose two of the characters that we looked at closest being the doctor and bill in that episode their costumes weren't actually entirely historically accurate but that was a character decision because they weren't from that time and that period. And yeah. uh, we thought, well, if, if Bill as a character goes into the TARDIS wardrobe and, and the doctor says, oh, this stuff's from that period, she's not going to know the history of, of which class of person wore what garment and what fabric and which mm -hmm. garment went over which one. So deliberately made some choices which were slightly wrong, but which we thought Bill would make that she would like the crop jacket over the long coat over the dress because she thought it was cool. They were all from that period, but maybe they didn't wear them together that way. So the, the fabrics, the choices, the elements that, that sort of made the costume as a whole, as in individual components were from that period, but maybe how they'll put together as a look, that wasn't entirely accurate. The same with the doctor. He was wearing Doc Martin boots and modern uh, black trousers with it, but you know, the shirt and the collar and the stock and the, um, the top hat, they were all right to that period. So mm -hmm. sort of we did, did put character choices in that 
felt it was true to the story of what those characters would do rather than just being a slave to historical accuracy. Because I don't think that's something that, that all the Doctor Who fans, um, you know, we're not making a documentary, um, a historical piece. We're about the story and the adventure and the excitement. Mm -hmm. And people really love the characters. So trying to be true to all of that feels closer to home than just being a slave to the history of it. With the background characters, I think, I tried to be more accurate with those because they were from that period in that time and place. So adhering mm -hmm. to the rules of class, social status, everything, what they had access to in terms of the technology level of the fabrics and all that felt like it had to be more honest to sort of set the scene, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously then when you've got kind of futuristic um, set p uh, stories, you got more free reign, I expect. Oh yeah. Absolutely love it. I mean, when, um, when I started a Doctor Who, it's an absolute dream job for me. And when I started it, um, the episode two, um, where they went into the far future, originally in the script and in filming that, um, there was a, a whole lot of background actors crowd and there were some additional support characters, which um, that part of the story all went on the cutting room floor. But there was, there was sort of, I think, about two dozen people who we had to dress who were part of that futuristic society that the Doctor and Bill went to. Um, and for me, that was that was stuff that I absolutely loved doing. It was so exciting. We filmed that in um, in Valencia in Spain. This is amazing um, architectural. I think it's called the Art Science. Can't remember the name of it. This amazing place in Valencia in yeah. Spain where we filmed at this futuristic sort of micro city. Um, and so I, I I designed all these characters background that their costumes all sort of looked like they were built with the same 3D printing technology and, and architectural motifs and shapes and colours as, as that environment. So that making the, the sort of set design effectively and the costumes all work together and look like they're part of the same society. I love doing that. It was really exciting. Um, and we spent quite a lot of time on that. Unfortunately, it didn't make it into the final episode, but it meant we got to choose you know, unusual fabrics. There was a lot of holographic and translucent fabrics and ones with special 3D effects. We built a few costumes that were made out of fine aluminium fabric. I think one of those did make it in um, on one of the characters. You see her um, uh, in a field at the start and she's got a hood that's made out of this really fine aluminium metal. Yeah. And we built lights into a lot of the costumes and it was, it was really cool, exciting stuff that... Um, you know, you're only limited by your imagination and what's appropriate mm -hmm. for the episode, I suppose. Um, you know, if you go off on a, on a design jolly that completely doesn't sit in sync with or doesn't seem to respond to the narrative of the episode, then, you know, you've probably been a little bit self-indulgent and failed. But, um, but the journey of figuring out what the boundaries are, what fits and, and what's exciting for that episode, that's, that's great fun. So you've yeah. mentioned there that you took inspiration from the building that the, the, the um, episode was set in. Yes. Is that quite often something that you will do? You'll take inspiration from sets and designs and, and locations? Yeah, I think some of the stuff I get most excited about design-wise actually comes from outside of fashion and costumes. So um, architecture, props, um, different environments and textures and, and industrial design, um, engineering all these things are things that I, I look at and I find really exciting and interesting and figuring out um, unusual shapes and how things work and then trying to transpose those, I suppose, into costume is sometimes a, a huge challenge because you're trying to take shapes and structures and textures and things that weren't ever meant to move and be worn on the human body, but trying to respond to something outside of costume effectively as a design brief that you're then bringing into costume. I love doing that. It can be hugely frustrating, but um, but very enjoyable, um, I guess, to work from those references. Yeah. Um, so you've got um, established characters like the Doctor that had already got sort of costume elements. How much did you reuse and how much did you create new for the Doctor? Um, well, coming to Doctor Who, I... Obviously, I'd have watched all of, of series eight and nine before I started work on series 10. So I was up to speed with what Peter Capaldi had been wearing as, uh, as the 12th Doctor. But um, I went to it with an open mind because I knew that when you're coming to work on a show and other people have really been working on it for several years, there's there's been years worth of ideas, conversations, um, things people love at the beginning, then they get sick of, and then they want to do something else, but then somebody else loves it. And I thought there's, there's so much information there I've got to find out. 
um, before I go any further. Um, I did sit down and design some new designs for the doctor before I started working on the show, um, which were miles away from anything we actually did because um, at that point I didn't have all that information. But once I talked to Peter about his doctor and how he saw his doctor and how the costumes needed to make him feel. Um, and then I talked to uh, Stephen Moffat and Brian Minchin, the exec producers about um, where they felt the 12th doctor had come from and was going and with the costumes, how that affected the look, um, you know, to get everyone's information and, and see how they felt about it and then try and find where, where were the crossovers? Because not everybody loves the same things. Not everybody has the same ideas about where things are going. And part of my job is to bring that information together and think, okay, well, this person really wants that and this person hates it. But I can't tell this person and I don't want to disappoint, make this person angry by putting that on them just to please this one. So you have to, you have to you know, really um, compromise, but in a positive way. So you'll say, okay, well, this person really wants this, but this person doesn't like it. How can we give them this but change it so it's more like this other thing this person wants? But not just working to a list a shopping list of things people do and don't like you want to try and actually think about it creatively and say well where's the character come from where are they going um what things do we really think are essential to keep that are core to this character and what things do we think are going to tell a story of where they're going and how they're changing um and try and bring some new ideas to the table that maybe hadn't been in play for the last couple of years or maybe that nobody had asked for, but they might like, and some of them they liked new ideas that I brought and some of them they really didn't like. So it's, it's finding a way through and trying to offer new solutions um, and options as you go. Um, and, and always, you know, be positive and be excited about it, but also keep an open mind that they're not going to love all of the ideas. And you, uh, you have to have a thick skin about that and think that it's just, it's just ideas. It's just, you know, enjoy the fun stuff. And, uh, keep talking to everyone and trying to find new ideas. So when I started, Peter, um, he said that his doctor, he felt, he felt had been traveling through time and space for so long. And we don't know what he'd been up to between the end of, of series nine and series 10. He'd been at the university of Bristol, but um, how long had he been there? Had he been away on adventures in between? And, and we liked this idea that Peter suggested that really said, um, this doctor's been around the universe, you know, a few times. Mm. He's seen a lot of things. His clothes need to feel lived in and worn and, um, I don't know, show something of, of, of the adventures he's been through. So that was my real starting point to look at layering pieces up, breaking them down and aging them. So you saw more things with holes and abrasion and aging on them um, in series 10 and, um, you know, and it got a little bit looser in places and then it got a bit neater and more precise in other places, responding to how the doctor was feeling at that point in the story, what was happening in the episode. Um, there was really a lot of freedom in it, which was quite nice. Um, and we tried out a lot of different things, which was great. Sometimes we'd, we'd try something and, and we'd film an episode with it and we liked it at the time. But then when we watched it back, we thought that was, you know, we felt right at the time and it was great, but let, let's try this other thing and go in another direction the yeah. next time. Um, because none of us, really live in uniforms and wear the same thing from one day to another. Uh, and even though the doctor historically tends to have a look per each doctor, it's usually not set in stone that the exact same pieces that make up that look. So it's finding a style, I suppose, and having the mm -hmm. freedom to be able to play around within that. Um, a, a huge part of the direction came from Peter, as well as from each episode director, as well as from Stephen Moffat and Brian Minchin. It was, um, it was very collaborative and it was really important to listen to them to make sure that I understood where the doctor from their viewpoint was coming from and, and how I could support that, I suppose, with costume. Yeah. Obviously you had a new, a new companion as well with Bill. How yeah. much was, how much of that was you and how much was um, Pearl? Well, in the beginning it was, um, it was slightly the blind leading the blind for us because <laughs> uh, we, we shot the um, friend from the future uh, promo um, I found out I had the job on Doctor Who and then I was told a couple of weeks later um, we were going to be filming the promo with a new companion but at that point I didn't know who the new companion was what sort of character the new companion was and so I only actually found out it was Pearl uh, the day before I met her uh, we met for a coffee in central London with a couple of other people who were key people on the show and and 
really all the information that that Pearl and I together got about who Bill was, uh, we got at that point in that coffee, uh, hearing about um, uh, that she was to be someone who was not sort of an everyday girl next door character. She was an individual. She was someone who people liked, um, but she was someone who who was young and fun and energetic and positive and really had a sense of adventure and that the audience could feel that they really knew her. Um, but being told that without actually being told specifically who this person was, there was, and we didn't have a script at this point, knowing what situation she was in and how she was responding to them. We were sort of, uh, was the blind leading the blind? So we had that coffee and a chat and then um, Pearl and I went off shopping together, um, trying to figure out, who is Bill? What does she like? Um, so one point I, I suggested to start with was music, because um, I find that really, particularly with a contemporary character, can really help you figure out someone's identity, how they see themselves based on, you know, particularly if they're a young character, what music they listen to. Um, and, uh, and I suggested some Motown and some 70s music and things. And then that really started informing the pieces we looked for. We, we used a lot of um, sort of 70s related rib knit tops and coloured stripes and things throughout the mm -hmm. series, which kind of all started from the first few we found when we went shopping and that first shopping trip. Um, the Prince t-shirt that I um, found in a uh, Beyond Retro shop, uh, at that point, I think Pearl and I were in there looking at some oversized like letter jackets going along the row. And then there was a whole lot of um, sports t-shirts and things. It was in, um, yeah, just this dungeon vintage shop. And uh, and then I just saw the the sleeve with the MTV logo sticking out on this T-shirt, pulled it out, and it was this vintage Prince T-shirt with a really cool print on the front. Um, and we both loved it and thought it was really graphic and fun and a bit retro. Uh, not everyone loved it because they thought the face was was very distracting because it was so graphic. Mm. Um, and uh, at first, it was it was not something that was going to be used. And Pearl and I loved it. And on the day she put it on, the day we were going to be filming the, the promo, she put it on the morning and I said, well, you know, guys, just have a look at this, see what you think. And they weren't sure, but they agreed it looked pretty cool. And so we went with it. Um, and it was originally just going to be for the promo. Um, and, uh, and and everyone loved it as a look for Pearl because it was something different. And, and that whole music angle, I guess, helped us to define from the beginning where sort of Bill was coming from identity wise. Um, but in terms of the fit of things, the fit of genes, how things moved on Pearl's body, she had a huge part in saying in all that because mm -hmm. sometimes if you're filming an episode, um, you know, for two weeks and you're wearing the same costume or you've got six copies of the same costume, if you're having to wear the same thing every day and you're running and, and, and doing lots of things in it, like in, um, in episode nine where I can't remember the name of the episode, but where uh, with the, the Romans and the Picts, um, you know, she's running around in the mud and the outdoors and all and that mm -hmm. jumper and jeans for the whole episode. You need to be physically comfortable that you can do what you need to do as an actor in that. So she was involved in, in the say in all of that. Sometimes we'd buy things off and she'd wear them as they were off the peg. Sometimes we altered them quite a lot to make them feel right and fit right, um, both for the look on camera and for Pearl's comfort. So like with everything, it was a conversation about what people want and need and how um, it makes them feel and why really understanding, not just when someone says, I like it or I don't like it, but really it's important to understand why, because then you can yeah. get it right. Yeah, you've mentioned there that you had multiple copies of, of the same costume. Yeah. How many copies do you have? And, and are they all for the main actor or are they for sort of doubles and things? Uh, it varies hugely per episode. Um, mm -hmm. When you start and you get a script uh, for any show, you will instantly break down any places in the script where you think there might be a need to have more than one copy of a costume. Um, most costumes, you only ever have the one because that's all you need. If someone walks into a room, says something, walks out again, you don't need repeats of that. There's no stunts involved. But um, if you know that they're in the one costume for a whole episode, even if they're not doing stunts, you're going to need more than one costume because laundry, different things can happen. You mm -hmm. don't want to not have a safety net on it. But if we know that we're doing a stunt, well, you'll know straight away that you need the actor's hero costume, the main one that they wear that always stays clean. You'll need a second one, which something might happen to. If it's a series of events, not just one stunt or one action, you might need, you know, stunt set one, two, three, four for the actor. Plus they'll have stunt doubles and they need a clean set and maybe a damaged set. So it, it 
varies depending on why you need repeats um, within a scene. Even if someone walks into a scene and has water thrown all over them, you might need three copies of that costume because you'll need to film it more than once. Um, yeah. So um, it's really just trying to find out how severe the thing is that's happening um, and make sure that we're covered for it because no one wants to be the person who on set when they say we need to film it again, you say, oh, we can't, we've only got the one costume. Um, you know, that sometimes happens if, if something happens in a scene that you weren't expecting or that wasn't in a script, but if it's there, you should plan for it. And um, that's what we try to do. Yeah. Um, it's been great talking to you, but finally, um, have you got a favorite design from the series? Um, I don't know if I have one favorite design, but I think the part that I enjoyed doing the most was the spacesuits. Um, mm -hmm. Episode five, Oxygen. I nearly had a nervous breakdown doing that one because we, uh, oh, not, not nervous breakdown, but you know, I, it was, it was the most stressful and the most enjoyable. I, when, um, Nikki, the producer came to me and said, we're going to be doing a space suits episode. I was so excited and I enjoyed the whole process. Um, uh, but uh, you know, some of the actors we who were playing parts wearing space suits, we found out who they were very close to filming and we were making most parts of these suits ourselves in house. Um, so it was just getting them together in time with all the electrical wiring and switches. That was, um, that was stressful, but so much fun and, and seeing it all on set um, when it was done. The diving suits for Thin Ice, loved doing those. Mm -hmm. They were uh, actually had a copper smith make the helmets and the neck pieces oh, all wow. out of beaten sheet metal copper. They were made uh, like the original diving helmets were. Um, probably my favourites, though, were the blue space suits from, um, uh, from um, Mars. Um, why am I? Empress of Mars. Um, yeah getting to do new spacesuits for the TARDIS um, in series 10 that I felt sort of with the blue responded to maybe being something that had come out of that environment or made in the TARDIS or for the TARDIS. Um, I really enjoyed doing that. That was great fun. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. Um, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank Bailey. you. Thank you so much, Helen. Take care.